Hello, everybody, and welcome to this week's Hubble Hangout. This is a special edition Hubble Hangout because it is St. Patrick's Day. So I want to welcome you all here uh, for this really cool hangout where astronomers using the Hubble Space Telescope have developed a new data processing technique which has allowed them to, for the first time, measure the composition of an atmosphere of an exoplanet uh, that is of the class of a super Earth. And we'll talk about what all of this means as we get going in the uh, hangout. But it's very exciting stuff because they've been, they, I want, we're going to learn about the new method they've used to to make these measurements as well as what does it might mean for the uh, for exoplanet research in the future. So we'll get started by first introducing my my friends, my co-host, Dr. Carol Christian. She is the HST, the Hubble Space Telescope Outreach Scientist. Hello again, Carol. It's good to see you again. Hey, Tony. How are you? I'm doing really good because it's St. Patrick's Day. Are you excited? I know, Scott. Uh, yes, I don't have any green beer yet, unfortunately, for our drinking game, but... Yes, we're going to have to think later. what our word is. Yeah, we're going to have to come up with a drinking yeah, game. So you can drink coffee. Or I'll come up with it, don't worry. Yeah. I'm always... Okay, and that's sort of debauchery, drink. as always. Yeah. <laughs> So that means, and that voice is Scott Lewis, whom you guys know. He's our internet driver extraordinaire. And so welcome back, Scott. It's good to see you again as well. Thank you, Tony. I don't know. This, this hangout seems kind of exciting to me, guys. I can't wait to learn more about what this uh, what this exoplanet measurements are, are like and what they what they might mean. Um, but before we get going, and I introduce our guests from the University of College at London, we want to have you prepared to ask us questions. We want you to interact with us and join us in the St. Patrick's Day drinking game <laughs> where we have water <laughs> and coffee, okay? Oh, that's right. <laughs> All right. So uh, we, but, but we do want your, no, seriously, we want your questions and comments during the Hangout. Uh, and Scott, why don't you tell everybody how they can do that? Absolutely. So the, as I'm already seeing everyone loading in here, since we are live on YouTube using YouTube's live event, uh, you can go ahead and use the live chat. So I'm seeing our frequent flyer and regular uh, commenter Michael Jobin's in there grinning. Hi, Michael. Yes. So he's grinning that we're alive. So yes, hi everyone. Um, <laughs> so if you have any questions or comments uh, regarding today's show or uh, or the research that's been put out there, please feel free to ask us questions, make your comments in there, uh, have a friendly discussion. Uh, I do have the band hammer ready if I need to, and I will use it. Uh, but more, more than likely, you guys have been really, it's been really awesome. Uh, the other way too that we are going to be uh, continuing this conversation, both live and afterwards, is using the hashtag Hubble Hangout on Twitter. So I'll be live tweeting as we're going along, uh, complete with any graphics and links to press releases and things like that as we're going on. So I will be monitoring uh, the the Twitter feed. We also have events up on Google Plus and Facebook, so I'll be monitoring those as well. So if you have any uh, any questions or any insightful comments, uh, please feel free to send them our way, and we'll make sure that uh, I bring them up, and we'll try to get them answered on air. Did you say the Hubble nice. Hangout hashtag part two? I did, Hubble Hangout. That's what someone tells uh, me. And the drinking game, I think it's going to be either hydrogen or helium. Whenever you say that, <laughs> I was gonna pick exoplanet, but okay, yeah. I'm gonna well, exoplanet's a little too easy. I I, I do okay. I do love everyone's no, a little bit. No, okay. I want hydrogen cyanide. Hydrogen cyanide. Oh, well, well, this is gonna be a pretty sober one then. Okay. <laughs> no drinking hydrogen cyanide. Uh, of course, there's the phone call. Oh, oh, good. Carol, the president's calling. Okay. Good. Yeah. Or it's your boss saying, "Stop talking about drinking on air." That's right. <laughs> Fair enough. Okay, so as I... I mean, my boss did. Yeah, really, that's right. What do you do with all my drinking games on Hubble? Okay, so, <laughs> so let's go, we'll go ahead and get started. So for the first time, astronomers have been able to measure directly the composition of a super-Earth exoplanet um, and of the star system known as 55 Cancri. And this is a star system that is about 40, life, 40 light years from Earth in the constellation of Cancer. And so joining me to talk about this are some a group from the University of College at London, all three of these guys. So we have Angelo Ciaris, he's a PhD student. We also have Ingo Waldman, a postdoc, as well as Marco Rochedo, a grad student. All of these guys are responsible in some way or another for the development of this technique, which we will get into. But welcome, guys. Is this your first Hubble Hangout? Hey, thank you. Yes, hi guys. All right, good. Well, thank you for joining us. So let's start with uh, let's start with you, Angelos. Um, tell us a little bit about 
what you found and a little, little bit about this super earth. Give us some background on this. Uh, as you said, the super earth is uh, 40 light years away from uh, the earth, and it's orbiting uh, its host star uh, in a, a very close. So the orbit is only 18 hours. Uh, this means that the, the temperature on this Earth... Whoa, 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 the orbit of this planet is 18 hours? 18 hours, yes. This year is... Oh, wow, that's pretty... So it's smoking. It's going around pretty good. <laughs> that, makes you, that makes you even older than you thought you were, Tony. That's right. So, I can't eat years. I am uh, about a billion years old. Thank you. Right. Thank you, God. I'm glad you pointed that out. You, you know, I'm here to help. Hydrogen cyanide. The more you know. <laughs> <laughs> okay, go ahead. I'm sorry. <laughs> okay, so that makes it a very extreme example. So it is uh, the temperature on its first surface is expected to be about 2,000 uh, degrees Kelvin. So that's like 3,000 Fahrenheit. 2,000 Kelvin, 18 hour year. This yeah. place does not sound like a vacation spot. <laughs> no, it doesn't sound really pleasant, no. Uh, all right, well, uh, did, was and this... And it has hydrogen cyanide. Oh, okay. <laughs> you, you realize, Carol, I'm going to be bouncing off the wall. <laughs> so I'm we gonna... gave away our punchline, so... Uh... <laughs> With our drinking game, but the uh, I want to. So, is this exoplanet? Um, fi it's 55 Cancri E, and the E is uh, what does that what does that E mean? By the way, it's a little E, which apparently matters. So, what does that mean? Uh, there are uh, uh, five planets in this system. So, so they have, so they system. name them in order of distance from the sun, or the distance uh, they were discovered. No, in order of uh, discovery, mm -hmm. I think so. The 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 order is uh, E. B, C, uh, F, and D. As you go from the inner to the outer. What? Uh, where's A? Uh, a no, is the star. A is the star. star. <laughs> Nobody said that. I thought that was just the, the 55. Yeah. No, it, it's just when you're in Canada. You're like, oh, it's over there, eh? Uh, okay. Okay, I got it. Yeah. Thanks. Oh, dear. All right, well, uh, so the E is, the, is an indicator for the, the fact that this was the fourth, I guess, right, uh, planet for that was in yeah. that system. And that was about 2004, if I remember correctly. Okay. Yeah. All right. And Ingo, can you tell me a little bit about the um, the the program, the observations that were used with Hubble uh, to sort of gather this data? You were telling me somebody was telling me, but I'll ask you anyway. What the 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 data came from a request from a much larger group, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's a U.S. group, and the the request is a you know it's a Treasury proposal, and so all the data is immediately public. And um, you know we. We we built this pipeline and we just ran it on the on the archive on the Hubble archive. You know, we just pulled the entire thing down. Wow, uh, <laughs> <laughs> that's great. Yeah, you, know, uh, you just put it on the cluster computer. It's fine, and um, and yeah, you know, and then we get we get the spectrum out and we're like, oh wow, that's that's interesting. So yeah, let's go ahead and have a look at it. Um, and uh, so Marco, this was done with the. Uh, with the instrument on board uh, Hubble called the Wide Field Camera Three, right? Yeah, that was. Tell us a little bit about that camera. What's it? What what sort of observations does it make? Does it give you? So basically, you you obtain spectra of of um, the, the the system as the planet transits in in front of the star, and the technique that Angus actually developed um, was able to uh, correct for the. Systematics that are involved with this kind of measurements uh, at a very accurate uh, uh, level, so that we were able basically to to obtain a spectrum that showed some uh, modulation, which indicated that this this planet um, had actually an atmosphere. Okay, I want to get to that processing technique in just a minute, but I wanted I just wanted to finish laying the groundwork for the system itself and where it is. So this thing is about forty light years away. Mm -hmm. Not going to be something we're going to be heading to. I think the next, well, also from the sound of it, we wouldn't really want to. Uh, but what is this? I want to talk a little bit about what a super Earth is. Is it like a place where Superman comes from? What What is a super Earth? <laughs> I don't what that is. Well, it's a it's a it's a star. It's a planet class that we don't actually have in our own solar system. So it's it's kind of weird, right? Before that, we somewhere between Earth radius and Neptune. And up to sort of ten 
Earth mass. But, it's, but it's important, it's a rocky planet, right? That's between the radius. Not necessarily, and... not necessarily. So it's assumed to be mainly terrestrial, but we don't really know. So some of them could be mini, mini Neptunes. Um, 55 Cancri is probably very rocky inside, well, more sort of molten lava sort of thing. Um, yeah, but we don't have that in our own solar system, so it's quite an interesting planet right. type. Earth is about the biggest rocky planet here, right? I'm, yeah. gosh, that'd be embarrassing if I didn't know that. But um, yeah, that the, be. yeah. <laughs> thanks, that Scott. Pretty embarrassing. Yeah, thank you for for pointing that out. But uh, yeah, the so so for for these things to be between the size of the Earth and say Neptune, as you say, is there an upper limit to how big these rocky planets can get? I mean, are there these would be awfully heavy, correct? So at some point they might just, would they, is there a point where they just crush themselves or is there an upper limit to how big super-Earths can be? Well, if they're rocky, I guess that's a, that's a more involved question than I thought because you're saying they're not necessarily terrestrial, so... Yeah, so, you know, it's, it's, it's just a definition of size at the moment. But yeah, if they're, if they're terrestrial, if, if they're big enough as a core, right, you, you'd assume that they create loads of hydrogen in their formation and that they actually end up like Jupiter. Okay, and all right. If they get too heavy, they have a big pull. Okay, well, that, that yeah. sort of leads into a comment that, uh, that Michael Jobin has left on YouTube, and I'll, we'll go ahead and get to that now. He was commenting on the, the fact that this has got an 18-hour orbit, and he goes, man, I bet it is egg-shaped or something. So that's a, but the, the point I think he's making, and I'd like to follow up on that, is isn't that, isn't that going to do some crazy things? I mean, the Earth is not, is not a perfect sphere. It's something called an oblate spheroid, which, because it's spinning and rotating, it's sort of flat in the middle. Uh, so is that affecting this thing's shape at all? It's got to, right? Or do yeah. we know? Yeah, no, it's, it's got it, to. It must be affected by tidal forces. Yeah. Because it seems it is clo so close. Yeah. And you know, the, the surface is like lava by itself mm -hmm. anyway, so it's. It's not really big, rock. No, solid rock, I guess. Yeah. Probably. Yeah, it's a thousand degrees above like melting point of iron. Okay. So, well, let's get to how you know that, then. Let's go to your processing technique. And since, uh, and since Marco, you were the one... Uh, Wait, can I who, ask a question? I was just... I because there are a number of uh, spectrograph <laughs> on HST, um, explain why the WIF uh, Wide Field Camera 3 spectrograph is the one you needed. Because we've talked about, on, this, on Hangouts, we've talked about the uh, cosmic origin spectrograph, which sounds cosmic, and um, STIS spectrograph. So why is Whitefield Camera 3 specifically interesting for this? So uh, um, it's uh, the infrared part of WFC3 camera, uh, which is uh, between 1.1 and 1.765 micron. And it's uh, more interesting because uh, we can see signature, micro signatures at these wavelengths. Uh, so this, the signal that we get from the planet is not uh, dominated by Rayleigh scattering or uh, maybe the presence of clouds. So we can see molecules easier. Ah, OK. OK, so thanks. It is possible to see molecules on the other wavelengths, sort of wavelengths. Well, very small water features, for example, could be seen with STIS, but really WIFCAM3 is the instrument to use if you want to detect uh, molecular features uh, with Hubble. And oh, okay. practically you would like to go even further red to where the biggest molecular features uh, are, but WIFCAM3 is actually the best instrument right now that we have to, to observe in that regional uh, spectrum. Well, and that leads into, I think, what I like, where I'd like to go with this is that it is, I think this is the kind of observation that might be more routine with uh, something like Jane, the James Webb Space Telescope, which is going to be entirely an infrared telescope. And, and one of its goals in science is to do the kind of measurement that you guys uh, have made here. And this is the, uh, what's, what's exciting about what you've done is that this is the first detection of gases in an atmosphere of a super Earth planet. This is the first time this has been done. And using Hubble, uh, and as you, we just talked about, the Whitefield Camera 3, which is a primarily an infrared telescope uh, or infrared camera, the, uh, you were able to get this detection of what was in this atmosphere. And I want to talk about how you did it. So what was your new, you had to invent a processing technique to get this done. So what did you do? And I guess I'll, I'll send that to uh, Marco since you're the main, you're the, the one that's... Uh, All right, no, him. Right. 
This um, is Wonder Boy. Well, oh. uh, so the main problem with uh, this kind of observation is that uh, we can only do uh, these measurements uh, in very, very bright targets, very bright stars, close by, uh, very close to us. Uh, on the other hand, we have WC3 camera and especially the infrared detector, which is very sensitive. Uh, this means that we can. It's very difficult to observe these uh, targets, and uh, the, because they will saturate yeah. your your CCD cameras, your detectors. And, right. And the, the bright, the light from the star is so bright <laughs> compared to the reflected exactly. light from the planet. And right. the camera was made for a fainter uh, targets so or for cosmological uh, research mainly. Right. Uh, so. Uh, a new technique was introduced, uh, I think, 2012. So uh, during the observation, instead of uh, having Hubble staring at the target, uh, Hubble is moving, uh, moving in a way that uh, the, the star is no longer uh, at the spectrum. Actually, is not uh, standing at actually one position on the detector, but it's moving uh, along uh, one uh, the one axis detector. So um, this makes the process of the data a bit more difficult because there are um, other systematics uh, going into this. And okay, so, so let me just make sure I understand what you just said. You're, you take a, uh, you, you open the exposure and you move Hubble uh, back and forth just a little bit or in one direction and you smear it out across the detector. Am I imagining this right? We have a figure for this. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so it's the figure with, it's a, the with, one with the with the blob, right? The blob he's talking about, Scott. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but it's essentially it's you know it's essentially smearing like it's slewing across the star because it has no shutter. That's the main problem. Right, and so this is the field of view. By the way, the Hubble has got a tiny field of view, and it, it, the, the way I've always described it is it's like a, a grain of sand held out at arm's length up at the sky. That's how much of the sky it images at one time. So it's very small. Okay, he's got it up. So why don't you show us what we're looking or tell us what we're looking at here. Uh, so the, the telescope actually is looking across the white uh, arrow. There's the white arrow on the... Uh, That's the smearing of the... Of the spectrum. Uh, on the this spectrum. So yeah. now this is the spectrum of 55 Cancri, right? This is the star. Yeah, yes, of the star. star, yes. Okay. So you've and, taken uh, that and you've smeared it in one direction. Across, yes, like across the white arrow. Yeah, exactly. And uh, in this case, because the target is very bright, you have to uh, scan very fast. So uh, this is an eight seconds exposure, about. That's like 300 pixels or something scan. Okay, what does this get you? What What's yeah. the advantage here? Well, excuse me? What does this get you? Why, why, why do you do this? What's the, uh, what is, what is the... Well, otherwise, otherwise the, 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 because of... It'll just saturate the detector? Measurement. Yeah, so immediately, because it has no shutter, that's the problem. Yeah. That as soon as you look at the star, you're going to saturate with Comfrey. With Comfrey is so sensitive, right? It's built for cosmology, and not for, like, looking at the next by star. Um, which we kind of have to do for exoplanets because the the signal we're looking for on the planet is, is you know is one photon in ten thousand. So we need loads of photons. So we need a bright star. So so as soon as we look at uh, at the star, it just saturates immediately. And the only thing we can do without a shutter is just move Hubble along, just sort of smear it uh, the signal across the detector. Okay, I can see how this gets you a non-saturated spectrum of the star. Uh, without you know going reaching the limits of each pixel and, and and blowing them out, but the where's the planet in this? How do you extract? <laughs> well, so the, these observations, as uh, Mark said before, are during the transit of the planet. So we're looking ah, at the, okay, that's important. We're looking at the star, but in between the star and us, there is a planet. So, like if you think an experiment in a physics lab where you have a lamp and a cold uh, uh, a cold air and light is going through and then you get to the spectrum. So it's something like this. We have the stellar light going through the atmosphere of the planet. Mm -hmm. So it's filtered through the atmosphere and it's carrying a signal. But I think you said the signal is one photon per 10,000. So, 
So embedded in this star spectrum, this smeared out star spectrum, is is an is the spectrum of the light that has gone from the star through the planet's atmosphere because it's transiting and into the uh, detector. And so somewhere in there, and you're saying out of for every ten thousand uh, photons, one of them is is from the planet. You're a, there's a there's a embedded spectrum in there that you have to somehow extract. Am I getting that right? Yes. Right. Yes. Exactly. Okay. And if you observe this, this planet um, as it transits, so you have a spectrum of the star alone without the planet and the spectrum of the star with the planet, with the spectrum of the planet in, implanted in it. And there are techniques basically to recover this, um, the, the, the signal, um, the spectral signature uh, of the planet. And basically, Is that the bottom part there? Is uh, that... Well, that's no. the extraction bit, which yes. Probably, so uh, this is this is how we deal with some systematics that are caused by the this scanning process. Uh, but the main thing is that we we extract the stellar flux per wavelength, and then we study the light curve. Uh, so if you have a normal photometry uh, of a transiting planet, like all the like Kepler, for example, or other uh, light curves that detect uh, exoplanets, you have. Uh, you can see the the flux going down during the transit. If you do that in different wavelengths and you measure the the depth in either different wavelengths, then you can uh, you can see if uh, the depth is changing. And that leads us to our next uh, figure, where is the spectrum and the final result. So, okay, let's take a look at that. But before we change this guy, what are these little vertical dots? These little circles? Ah, so this is where uh, the different wavelengths are. So, so the, the different photons of the different wavelengths. So, as Hubble is uh, uh, is scanning, then the, the spectrum is not uniform across the detector, and that's why it took us uh, something more. To, uh, it, it's a bit more difficult to extract the spectrum. Oh, so you're, that's a that's a mapping of the irregularities yeah, in the yeah. pixel. Of yeah. the, it's a mapping of the spatially scanned spectrum, and not and not a simple spectrum that usually is like in one dimensional. Oh wow, that's pretty cool. Okay, I can see the differences in it. Okay, I just wanted to know what those were. Okay, so Scott, if you could go to the next one and we can see hopefully what what they found. So, so what is this? So, <laughs> you, you, you recognize it, right? <laughs> if you guys are having problems, because it looks like you're squinting, uh, you can click on my thumbnail and it'll make it full screen for you. That's um, right. Go ahead and click on Scott's thumbnail, and you'll yeah, be able to full size. Okay. What's the confusion? It's like we can't really see anything. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm, the, I'm just making up uh, data sets as we're going along. Scott's yeah, what about this one? That's right. He's what do you think of this? Kind of like her from Kepler up or something. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so what you see in the top is the actual spectrum, and it's it's the the, the spectral signature of. Uh, probably hydrogen helium, um, uh, which has basically ob been obtained with, with this technique. Okay, so there's a lot here. There's this is the top one is an atmospheric absorption thing. This is where the the uh, the chemical or whatever the atoms are that you're looking at would be absorbed, and then along the bottom, this is the wavelength. Is that uh, right? Yeah. So x-axis is a wavelength. Icons. Okay. Yeah. Yes, uh, but on the top of the, of the top is the, the actual spectrum from WFC3. So it is between 1.1 and 1.67 uh, micron. And uh, the data are the transit depth, as we, as we told, as we said before, the transit depth at different wavelengths. It and basically right. shows how big is the planet at different wavelengths. Yeah, so exactly. the planet appears smaller or bigger at different wavelengths because there are some gases that absorb light at different wavelengths. So this is basically what, what this figure is telling us, that it's not flat, so if you suppose like a rocky surface without an atmosphere, you would see a flat line, but ah, okay. a modulation uh, with uh, several sigma um, significance, uh, we can say that there is a gas that is causing these differences, basically. So at different wavelengths, the planet is smaller or larger depending on what wavelength you're looking at. And this is at just one point across the star, isn't it? Well, we follow the, the entire... Uh, I know you followed it across the entire transit, but this graph is at one spot, right? 
Well, yeah, that's kind of the, you know, that's the overall averaged eclipse depth of um, the okay. light. Of the entire transit, I see. Yeah. Okay. So you had to extract a signal. I just want, I want to emphasize this because this is amazing. You had to extract a, one, a signal one ten thousandths uh, as bright as what was coming from that star, and you did it. You have these, these vertical lines on this top graph are your error bars. Uh, some of them, presumably, it means how confident you are of the, of this measurement. Correct. Yeah. Okay. And so here, so you you saying that if it was a uniform rocky planet, that it would be flat, but yeah. this isn't flat. This isn't flat. No, this is far from flat. And yeah. So, so what does that mean? Well, <laughs> and, and, <laughs> that the surface is not uniform, right? So it, it means that there is something above the surf, above above the surface, and this is probably gases. Right. So look, look, gases. Look, yes. I mean, that's where I was going. Okay. That's the exciting thing, right? Before we looked into two superbs before um, GJ twelve fourteen and HD nine seven. Uh, Another one, six, five, eight. Oh, yeah, I had property on those. <laughs> <laughs> I had a cell. Six, six, five, eight. And, and they were completely flat, right? So, so we just saw a perfectly flat line, and Hubble kept looking at it over and over, and we looked with ground-based observatories and splits there, and it's flat. So is it possible, then, that a telltale sign of an atmosphere is the, the flatness of that particular looking graph in other exoplanets? If you see that, you can say, well, it probably doesn't have an atmosphere. Well, it does. It might. It's assumed that these planets have an atmosphere, but have a cloud deck that hides any other. Or water. that would be right. the other. So plane, right whatever it is, it's atmosphere. uniform. It's either rock or a uniform <laughs> atmosphere. Okay. Cool. Great. Well. So. And so my understanding is that so you've shown the data points, and then and then you do uh, then you say, well, what can this be? And then you make a, a hydrogen and helium model. And that's the dashed orange line, and you say, "Oh, okay, that doesn't work either. It's not flat, and it's not just hydrogen and helium." And then you try to figure out, in addition to hydrogen and helium, what else is there. Is that the idea? Right. Exactly. Well, with a pre-step of you see, and it's not flat, and you panic because you think something's broken. <laughs> <laughs> Or you didn't calibrate it properly, or you're not. You know. It's like a panic, so they had to invent a clever technique to analyze it. <laughs> <laughs> I like panic-driven software. <laughs> good. Okay, so, so the is so the bottom the bottom graph then is your as Carol said that's your model of uh, if it was just hydrogen and helium, uh, and then um, actually I guess I don't understand some of this. So the the Spitzer data. Well, help me understand this bottom graph. Okay, so we, we basically have uh, the same models we see above, the, the orange line that shows the, the hydrogen helium only atmosphere, and the model with, which includes the um, hydrogen cyanide uh, at a long in a longer wavelength range, right? So if we could observe this this um, spectrum at, uh, in a longer wavelength range. Uh, these would be the two models that we are looking at, and as as Carol was saying that uh, we cannot really distinguish between the H2 and helium model and the HCN detection. So we are we, we weren't actually claiming a full HCN detection, but there is just an indication that HCN That's not hydrogen cyanide, by yeah. the way. I mean, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, here I go. HCN is also qualifies. So if you hear that, <laughs> I'm gonna have to grind more coffee beans real quick. Hold on, I'll be back. <laughs> So if you really want to distinguish between the two models, we need to go to, to longer wavelengths, and, and that's where um, James Webb will be able to do. So that, that Spitzer point you see there, that's the only photometric point with a super large error bar that we have that doesn't really help uh, the <laughs> colors, let's say. Right. <laughs> so, so just to, to, for people to, to look at this and understand, if you look at the lower lower one, you see a rectangle, and the rectangle is where the wide field camera three data is, if I understand this correctly, and that is expanded above, so you can see it spread out more. But the whole model covers the whole wavelength region, and this is the demonstration that okay, Spitzer didn't give us enough data points. Boy, we would like to have some James Webb of this. Yeah. To <laughs> really it down. That's what we all want. <laughs> Okay, now one of the trademarks of, of hydrogen cyanide being in an atmosphere is that hydrogen cyanide <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> <laughs> is, 
is an indicator of a very high <laughs> ratio good. of carbon to oxygen. Okay, so that means there is a lot of carbon uh, in this in this atmosphere as well. What is that? What is that uh, ind indicative of? Anything as, as far as the, uh, the habitability of the planet? Or I mean, is there any? Oh my God, it's too hot. Yes. Yeah. Well, I know the temperature. Well, the reason why all the tardigrades on there have turned to charcoal. Yeah, it's, I it's like way too I extreme like, for them. But see, I like hot hot planets. So, well, <laughs> you can go back to Florida. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So, no, this 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 is an indicator of having a very high ratio of carbon to oxygen, and I just want to talk a little bit about what that might mean as far as the uh, other aspects of the nature of this planet. Right. I mean, there, there were the previous studies that even the carbon to oxygen ratio is so high that the entire inside of 55 countries made out of diamond. So I don't know whether that's now confirmed or not. I mean, it's been debated massively in the field, but it, it's not the first measurement that shows that there may potentially be quite a lot of carbon in there, so a highly reduced atmosphere. So, so, very, so you see, Scott, it is now, now it is a, a pretty fun place to go. Lots of diamonds. Yeah, lots of that's diamonds. That's all you, man. <laughs> That's all you. That's all me. <laughs> just saying. I, I'm right. Scottish. I will just like I go outside here and I burst into flames. Going there was just yeah. <laughs> uh, right. Yeah, that would be true. The sunburn would be uh, quite supreme. All right. Well, so now that you've got this technique down and you've been looking at uh, the super Earth and you've got a pretty good idea of its atmosphere, the fact that it even has one, and hopefully we've shown a lot of people what that's like to uh, to you know, be able to determine whether some of these ex or super Earths have an have a uh, uh, atmosphere or not. Um, are you going to be turning this technique to other uh, other systems? Are you doing? Are you spreading this out a little bit more, or is there more work to be done on this? Bye, Carol. Yeah. Um, well, there. Are, uh, uh, we expect also in the future for more close uh, super Earths to be found. So there are missions that. Uh, uh, are dedicated to finding uh, small uh, planets around close by stars, uh, but since a star, this uh, since these stars are going to be close by, we're going to have the same problem with Hubble. We need to use the same uh, the same technique, and uh, so use the the Hubble to scan uh, for these targets. Uh, so we will need we will have to use the same technique. Yeah. There's no alternative for that such bright. Well, the, the problem so far is that we don't have enough super Earths uh, yes. discovered. <laughs> so right. there's just right. a bank that can be observed with 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 Cam three or you know any uh, telescope. So what we really want is to have new super Earths discovered, yes. and then we'll be able to also observe. There are a few others that um, need to be observed um, yet. So we will well we're we going to propose to 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 observe these. Um, yes, I guess it, it, that's a good point. I guess it's not enough to just have Hubble observations of these systems. You've got to have the specific smeared observations yeah, so yeah. you can apply your technique and, and, and extract the signal from the planet out. So you yeah. really got to redo this. Yeah. You need the target as well. So, I mean, there's, you know, the NASA has the test mission approved and hopefully going up. That's right. TESS is Transiting Exoplanet Survey Satellite. That's going to be launched Woo! next year. Next year, right? Yes. Yeah. And TESS will just provide, a, hopefully, hopefully, a fantastic amount of close-by super-Earths. At least, you know, that's what the propaganda says. <laughs> um, now, but will that, will that signal be, it won't be the smeared type. You'll, you won't need it. TESS will be able to do this in a way that doesn't saturate things, correct? Right? Just find some. TESS is just a photometry mission. Right. right, so it's similar to Kepler, but it looks at the close by stars. Kepler looks at the very far away Kepler field, and they're too faint for us to actually do some proper follow up. So we have loads of super Earths in the Kepler field, but they're just too faint. For okay. Us to do something. We're starting to get a few questions in from the uh, YouTube chat, so let me get those so, out. Just to be clear, they want more super Earths, and they want JWST time. Fair enough. <laughs> 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 You know, just the small things. I don't think small things in life. You know, I, I want to use a telescope that's the area of a t of a tennis court, four stories tall, and I want more planets that more, are. You know, yeah. Send them, send them their way. Uh, <laughs> I'll, I'll write Santa for you this this year, okay. and we'll see what we can do. 
people, aren't they? And you know what, Carol? I don't think we've ever had anybody on this hangout that said they'd wanted less Hubble time. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know, I've got that, all this that observation could be true. time. That could I just be true. can't handle it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I don't need any more. Thank you. Um, so true. there's somebody. There's a question here about whether you recorded uh, several. Tra how many transits did you record of 55 Cancri? Was it just one? Uh, two. 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 Transits. Okay, good. And uh, Ken Brandt is asking, um, is the planet tidally locked? I wonder what it, the night side temp is like. Is it tidally locked, first of all? It is. At least that's why we assume it is. Um, night side temperature is about 1,500 Kelvin. That's about 700, 800 Kelvin colder. 700, 800, okay. So that's uh, quite a difference. So we have a couple of artist impressions, and maybe, uh, maybe Scott could put one of those up. We'll take a look at that. Uh, briefly, of what it, uh, putting all of this uh, information together, you know, as, as um, astronomers do, they'd like to make these artist impressions of what they think it might look like. And so um, here we're looking at a planet very close to a star. Boy, the the uh, the sun is going to be very high in the sky, or big in the sky. That's, That's scary. <laughs> and you're saying, and it's red. You were saying earlier that it was primarily lava, right? No, yeah. Because of the tidal forces and the heat and and all of the other, and it's amazing that it even has. Why does? Why do you think the uh, the the solar wind from the star doesn't blow the atmosphere away? Ah, <laughs> oh, that's the one million dollar question. We have absolutely no idea at this stage. Okay, because that yeah would seem to be a pretty big factor in uh, in uh, <laughs> whether it had an atmosphere or not. That's pretty yeah. cool. Well, people didn't well, assume. It would have like a hydrogen atmosphere. It's it's not necessarily expected. So there may either be a process where it can hang on to its original hydrogen core, or some replenishing from a surface chemistry of it basically outgassing hydrogen constantly. Yep. And so the yeah. So this would be um, and uh, and this was uh, what remind me it was one point. How big was was larger than the Earth? One point. Uh, in terms of mass, it's eight times larger. Eight, eight times, times larger. Okay, I thought it was... Eight times okay. heavier than the Earth, yes. Right, so and in terms of rating... Eight times larger than the Earth, so that's pretty It's pretty big. Okay, so and so that answers your question, Psy stri Strike. Um, wonder how long that atmosphere will deal with the solar wind situation, so that's a good question. Yeah, that's a, that's uh, something I guess uh, everybody would like to find out. The, uh, the, the, there's another idea that apparently the, the atmosphere may just be trans... You know, not, not permanent, that's that it may lose and regain its atmosphere from outgassing. So some previous observations looked at it, and they didn't find an atmosphere. We found a pretty clear signal in two different transits. So there may be, you know, there may be some, it may not be a permanent atmosphere altogether. I see. So you're saying that because of the tidal forces on the planet, the 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 stuff that's underneath that lava, whatever it is, could be just gases pouring out of the... Actually, that, that spitzer point that you saw in the in the previous graph was an average of several um, transits that were observed with Spitzer, and yeah. a previous study from a few months ago actually uh, showed that apparently this, this 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 Spitzer data point is varying a lot, indicating that maybe this atmosphere is is probably changing um, in size. Uh, well, so that's how you would know if those if those if those uh, data points were moving around pretty rapidly. It wouldn't be a very stable atmosphere. It'd be something gushing out of it and sort of yeah. making. Yeah. Oh, being observed with Spitzer, so yeah. you know yeah. it, it might well be. So the the thing is, you know, once we have James Webb time, we hope it's still there. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. That's Hint. Hint. That's got to wait just a couple Hint. years. Hint. Hurry up! <laughs> Hurry up! <laughs> that's right. Fifty-five Cancri is waiting for you. Hurry up! <laughs> All right, the uh, the nebulous princess is asking. This is a good question. Um, can the presence of an atmosphere that close to its star be used to infer anything about whether this has a magnetic field? I mean, do we know anything? Can that, can we learn anything about a magnetic field here? Um, just just because it has an atmosphere doesn't mean you've got a magnetic field. By no, the way, Mars no, doesn't. No, no. Have one. Yeah, just, we don't really know whether it has an iron core or not. Um, okay. It doesn't necessarily look like one. Um, we, we don't know, you know. There may if that active geologically, it might have some kind of. Uh, if it's outgassing, it might have some kind of dynamo at the center. So exactly, but whether it's a global dynamo, it's not clear. Uh, we know that the density of, of, the, of the planet is quite low. Yeah, but we don't know more about this about the core. The, I'm sorry, say that again. The density is low. You said. Yeah, the density is 
quite low. So the the the, target, the, the planet is quite it's large. Just for a for a Earth-like planet or for a rocky planet. For a planet that is eight times heavier than the Earth. Yeah. It's quite large. How how do you, so where do you get that how does how do you get the density from that? I'm very curious about that. So you, uh, the density comes from if you combine uh, if, you, if you combine measurement of transit and uh, radial velocity. So from radial this, velocity is the uh, pulling of the star as it goes around. Oh, okay, sure, because that would tell you about its mass. That's right. That's a good point. Okay, good. So well, you also measured the wobble of the star with uh, with WC3 as well. Okay. No, no, no. These uh, measurements are from uh, other instruments. Ops. So Hobbes is this high precision um, spectrograph. Oh, okay. I see it. You need very um, high resolution spectroscopy to, to to observe the shift of the lines of the stars due to a, such a small planet. So I don't know how many meters. It's We're talking about a few meters. No, it's just centimeters. No, centimeters. I don't know. I don't know how many centimeters. Right. So. The the difference between uh, uh, radio velocity and the uh, transit method, they each have their own strengths and weaknesses. They each tell you something different about the planet. In the case of, uh, of a transit, you can learn a lot about its size because of how much it blocks the star's light and from the radio velocity, how massive it is because mm -hmm. of how much it tugs on the star, except you have to compensate for all the other planets that are out there, which I'm sure you guys do. Uh, as well, right? So you can kind of get a sense of how massive this planet is, minus all the other planets pulling on the star. Yeah. Right. Well, in, in the radio velocity, the measurements they are taken into account, but they are not transiting. So for us, they're not affecting anything. <laughs> so <laughs> let's just read. Let's just summarize a little bit here, folks. Yeah, you know, sorry. We're gonna get a grip on this. Well, that is yeah, 10, so do, do your summary, but I, I want to know about this planetary system because w w what Angela just said was important that I had read about. That this is it, it has a bunch of planets, but this is the only transiting one. Yeah, yes, so doesn't that raise a question here? Anyway, go ahead, do your summary. <laughs> All I wanted to say was these guys have looked at a star. Smeared it out over a uh, over a camera that has you know rubber spectrograph. Picked out a signal ten thousand times dimmer than the star it was orbiting. Figured out what it was the atmosphere that first of all that it had an atmosphere and that it when what it was on it hydrogen cyanide among other things. <laughs> yes. And yeah, man. And from that, they also were able to look at, uh, at radio velocity ma images from other instruments to get a sense of the mass of this planet and having to deal with all of the other planets in that system. I mean, this is the kind of work that blows my mind because of all the things you've got to account for, not even to mention all the, the idiosyncrasies involved in the data itself. You've got to calibrate all the instrument effects out. I mean, this is amazing stuff as far as the signal and what we're able to learn from just literally a few photons. Just, I just <laughs> always in awe of this. So the system itself. Carol wants to learn a little bit more of the system itself. We've already talked about. There's five other, four other planets, I think. So, and, but they're not transiting. What are they doing? Are they doing some kind of, you know, polar yeah. orbit? <laughs> what are they doing? They're just not looking uh, like perfectly edge on. That's ah, the problem. The you can only see the, in, the inner one. Yeah. Because the other ones are just a bit, you know, not transiting in our line of sight. But they're, they're, they're doing fine. Yeah, they're doing fine. But <laughs> <laughs> they gave us a phone call. They're like, no, it's no worries. fine. We're, we're, just, okay. we're just not on the no same worries. level as you right now. It's 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 you, not me. Yeah. <laughs> because, just because we're not transiting, you don't like it as much. That's fine. We'll just sit over here in the dark. That's all right. But, this, <laughs> but it's important. Well, at, least, at least they've been found. Okay, so that's right. That's right. That's right. <laughs> Presumably that was solely from the radio velocity method, yeah. right? I mean, there's no other way to really tell, so that's that's all you have. I should point out that there's a real bias to the transit method, and that bias is that we're, we're only talking about planets Kepler. That's all it looked at were these dips in brightness. Uh, but that And it came up with an estimate of, uh, or it came up with a lot, you know, 5,000-plus candidate uh, planets around stars, that it, the 160,000 or so stars it was looking at. But that doesn't mean that's all there was. It's just how many were happened to be passing in between the star and the Kepler telescope, and the same is true here. There are so many planets, and they've come up that, and so they've ex extrapolated. And I'm not sure what the what the uh, method they used to do that was. But if you look at the transits we can see, 
and then you extrapolate that in some intelligent way, they have come up with the figure of 1.6 planets for every star on average in our galaxy. And so those are apparently include a lot of the ones that we can't see or that aren't transiting as well. So the the radial velocity method, though, that is not that does not suffer from that same bias. We'll see it no matter where they are, whether they're line of sight. Uh, whether yeah, they pass. Not exactly. I mean, uh, if they're tilted a lot, you don't see them. Well, if they're rotating, okay, so yeah. if we're looking from the top of the plane of the. Yeah. yeah. You'll see a wobble. You would see a wobble no matter what. Well, yeah, it wobbles, but then we wouldn't be seeing it. Then we'd be seeing astrometry. So Gaia would pick up on the, you know, 90 degree angle to the, to the plane once. So Gaia is probably going to find another 10,000 planets or so. Explain well. Okay, let's talk about Gaia. Gaia is. Uh, tell us a little bit about that. Gaia is amazing. I love Gaia. <laughs> <laughs> Got big thumbs up from Scott on Gaia. That's right. Gaia okay. is my friend. Gaia. Okay. Gaia is her. Is his friend. Okay. But tell us a little bit. Can you give us some little background on what Gaia is going to do then? Well, it's an astronomy, uh, um, astrometry mission uh, that's currently flying, mapping all the close by stars and and figuring out the parallax distances to to all the stars really high precision. But as a side product, the, the Gaia pipeline actually has a little exoplanet module attached to it, which just looks for tiny little wobbles um, of the star. And and they're, the, they're essentially the same thing than radio velocity, just looked at from a from a completely different angle. So instead of having the star going away and towards us, it's okay. going left and right. And exactly. instead of taking spectra, you actually take images, and you, you're going to see the, the star mm. uh, moving yeah. around. Right, and so for those of you who don't know, astrometry is this is the study of you know measuring exactly where something is in its distance uh, from us. So that's what astrometry does, and Gaia is going to be well suited to help us find that out for a lot of stars. So um, that's that's, a, that's an important mission. That's uh, that's when is that, is that that's happening soon, right? Yeah, it's happening. Well, it's flying now. Yeah, it's already you know we've talked about it uh, before, but yeah, it launched what 2013. Yeah, a couple of years now, so there are going to be some data release very soon, I think. You, know? okay. uh, so you need to wait many years. You need to wait many, many years before um, you can actually complete uh, uh, final data release with, with exoplanet discovery. You need a lot of time to, to observe the orbit of uh, every planet. That's right. You need, you need time series to really get an accurate uh, uh, Measurement of the motions of these things, which blows me away in another way too. But just the fact that we're doing that at all is just astonishing. But the, the so getting back to your super Earth uh, measurements here with uh, 55 Cancri E, the the um, it, I, since you were able to detect the atmosphere or in some of its components using this new technique, I can imagine that you could also use it, couldn't you, for things like uh, hot Jupiters or other planets that are. Passing yeah. around or orbiting around other stars. Have you? Have you? Uh, I mean, we could learn more about their compositions as well using this technique, couldn't we? And, and it might be easier because maybe the photon signal might be higher. Oh yeah, but it's a lot easier. It's so actually, easier, yeah. most of the observations of, of um, atmospheres of exoplanetary atmospheres have been done using hot Jupiters because the signal is much short, much stronger and it's much easier to observe um, the signal. Because the signal is stronger, you know, it's very extended atmospheres made of hydrogen and helium. While turning to super Earth sort of atmospheres, the atmospheres are smaller and are often assumed to be dominated by heavier uh, gases. And heavier gases will have um, smaller molecular features, which will be even more difficult to, to detect. So th this technique uh, of, of, of scanning um, the, the spectrum and, and, and basically uh, Moving Apple across the star is very useful for um, smaller planets with, with more dense atmospheres. So of course, it's also useful. Right, and the observations a lot. Well, in fact, most of the observations, well, even for hot Jupiters right now, are coming in yeah. a scanning mode because even for hot Jupiters, the brighter the star, the the star, the better signal yeah. we have. So we're taking advantage of this scanning even for hot Jupiters because we prefer the close by stars generally. Right, and because of, now you're saying because of the sensitivity of WIPC three, you were able you needed to do this this scanning technique. But do other instruments also use it? No, no, no. free. So it's pretty specific to WIPC three. What you've come up with? Yeah, and they, they kind of so they, they started off with WIPC three, and and realized 
you know, we can't actually do anything exoplanet related with that, just for the fainter targets, and that's difficult. Um, and so, so if that got introduced really late on. That got introduced sort of 2009. That's canning. That's 2012. 2012. 2012. And you know they, they they tried to play a bit a bit with that, and it took a few years to figure out how to keep the telescope stable, right? Because it has the reaction wheels basically turning, and it's a completely out of the box measurement. Um, but yeah, they figured it out quite nicely. Yeah, you guys need to be careful with how don't be breaking it with your weird. <laughs> <laughs> really push it to the extreme. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, that's great. I want to thank. This has been very interesting. I want to thank you guys. Uh, let me check in with Scott. Have you have you given me all the comments and questions that you've seen so far? Is there anything on Twitter? Uh, the uh, only other things we've actually answered while on air. So cool. everything well, else has been great. All right. All right, Carol. Do you have anything you like to add? Uh, no. I I think this is like astonishing. This uh, to invent the software technique and and analyze the data this way. And I think the 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 drifting of the telescope it's tricky, but wow, the payoff is big. So that's the thing about Hubble now is that you know as soon as an instrument is put on, everybody has a collection of things they want to do. And the great thing about the fact that Hubble's been around um, for a while is now we can really think about these new, unique, and innovative ways of using the telescope. And um, you know, nobody would have, in, <clears throat> excuse me, envisioned anything like this ten years ago. So yeah, very, very clever. It's very interesting. All right. So, uh, what's next for you guys? Anything? Uh, what, what are you going to do now that you've? Uh, are you going to go to Disney World or? Uh, St. Patrick's Day. Yeah, yeah, they're going to the pub. Oh, oh, going to the pub. Oh, I didn't mean that. I mean, <laughs> you that after, but <laughs> okay. <laughs> Fair enough. I, I mean, I think we all are. Um, <laughs> I, I, <clears throat> okay. So, uh, okay. Well, I guess that's it. Well, I want to thank you all. Uh, thank you guys very much for taking the time out to, sh to share your research with us. This is amazing stuff. I'm really impressed with the way in which not only you guys are using the Hubble and WIPC3, but this uh, processing technique as well. I'm hoping that we get... See, there's a phone call. That's, actually... <laughs> That's you this time. Oh, oh never <laughs> Wow. Oh, wow. Okay, I well... I've been the only one in all of our years that's never had my phone ring while on air because I'm a professional. All right. <laughs> I'm a professional. My phone never rings. Oh, my God. Uh, or like or, or nobody calls you. No, actually, my phone goes off like crazy. Oh, okay. It's going, no, 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 no. Everyone's blowing my phone because they, they know how pretty I am. They see me on air and like, oh, Scott. <laughs> and I'm lying. So. <laughs> All right. All right, guys. Well, thank you, guys. I want to thank, like I said, I was thank you guys for taking yeah, time out to awesome. research. We hope that you will uh, let us know if the next big the next big thing that you guys do with Hubble. Um, we're Absolutely. looking for. I'm wanting the app. I'm waiting for the app to come out that shows me, you know, how to, I want to do this data processing on my own smartphone. So let me know. <laughs> All right. Just and wandering through the archives, yeah. like looking for super earths. It's yeah. like Astro Tinder. You're like smear left, smear right. Oh, oh. That's right. Yeah. Exactly. Okay. So I'm waiting for that app. And you remember, you got to hear. And I, when you get your startup uh, money in in San Francisco, you'll think. I need think. to trademark Astro Tinder real quick. I'll be right back. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> smear left, smear right, and you got it. There's your there's your uh, ex hydrogen, hydrogen cyanide. Oh, yeah. Okay. How are you then? Are we all right? <laughs> well, thank you guys. No, no pictures with tigers. That just we'll put that out there. No pictures with tigers. <laughs> Angelos, Angelos Tiaras, Ingo Waldman, and Marco Rochedo from all from the University College at London. Thank you for taking time out to talk with us, and uh, good luck on on future stuff. You guys, yeah, are absolutely. Yeah. You're gonna, I can tell you're gonna make a big difference. So thank you for taking time out. Thanks very thank much. You, thank you. Thank yeah. you. All right. Well, on behalf of Carol Christian and Scott Lewis, I want to thank you guys for watching. We'll be back next week. What are we going to do, Carol? Do we know? Oh, might be something about massive stars. Could massive be. stars. Sounds Maybe. like a big deal. Ma right. oh, 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 no. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> Well, you got to think of the drinking game, so right. <laughs> think about well, the word you want. Well, I'm, I'm, I've, I've had like a, a pot of coffee this show, so I'm sure I'll have a lot of ideas. Oh gosh, yeah, things. really? Yep. Oh right. yay! Ask for Tinder. You heard it here first. Okay. <laughs>
<laughs> all right, folks, I want to thank you all for watching. Join us next week. We'll be back talking about presumably massive stars, but it might be a surprise. We'll, we'll let it you know. It might be a surprise. No, no. That's right. And if you're not subscribing to the Hubble Site channel, you need to do that because that's where you'll find out future events. Also, follow us on Facebook at Hubble, as Hubble Space Telescope. Right. Uh, we're on uh, Twitter at Hubble Telescope. So make sure you follow us, and uh, and we'll let, that's how you can learn about the next Hangouts. I want to thank you all for watching. I want to thank you guys for your questions and comments. They were awesome. They were, they were good awesome. ones, as they always are. We'll see you next week. And as always, until then, keep, keep looking up. Looking up. Hello, everybody, and welcome to this week's Hubble Hangout. This is a special edition Hubble Hangout because it is St. Patrick's Day. So I want to welcome you all here uh, for this really cool hangout where astronomers using the Hubble Space Telescope have developed a new data processing technique which has allowed them to, for the first time, measure the composition of an atmosphere of an exoplanet uh, that is of the class of a super earth and we'll talk about what all of this means as we get going in the uh, hangout but it's very exciting stuff because they've been they I want we're going to learn about the new method they've used to, to to make these measurements as well as what does it might mean for the uh, for exoplanet research in the future so we'll get started by first introducing my my friends my co-host Dr. Carol Christian she is the HST the Hubble Space Telescope outreach scientist hello again Carol it's good to see you again hey tony how are you I'm doing really good because it's St. Patrick's Day. Are you excited? I know uh, Scott. In here, since we are live on YouTube using YouTube's live event, uh, you can go ahead and use the live chat. So I'm seeing our frequent flyer and regular uh, commenter Michael Jobin's in there grinning. Hi, Michael. Yes. So he's grinning that we're alive. So yes, hi everyone. Um, so if you have any questions or comments uh, regarding today's show or um, or the research that's been put out there, please feel free to ask us questions, make your comments in there. Uh, have a friendly discussion. Uh, I do have the band hammer ready if I need to, and I will use it. Uh, but more more than likely, you guys have been really it's been really awesome. Uh, the other way too that we are going to be uh, continuing this conversation both live and afterwards is using the hashtag Hubble Hangout on Twitter. So I'll be live tweeting as we're going along, uh, complete with any graphics and links to press releases and things like that as we're going on. So I will be monitoring uh, the the Twitter feed. We also have events up on Google Plus and Facebook, so I'll be monitoring those as well. So if you have any uh, any questions or any insightful comments, uh, please feel free to send them our way, and we'll make sure that uh, I bring them up and we'll try to get them answered on air. Did you say the Hubble Thanks. Hangout hashtag part two? I did, Hubble Hangout. That's what someone tells uh, me. In the drinking game, I think it's going to be either hydrogen or helium. Whenever we say that, <laughs> I was gonna pick exoplanet, but okay, yeah. I'm gonna well, exoplanet's a little too easy. I I, I do okay. I do love everyone's no, a little bit. No, okay. I want hydrogen cyanide. Hydrogen cyanide. Hydrogen cyanide. Oh, well, <laughs> well, this is gonna be a pretty sober one then. Okay. <laughs> no drinking hydrogen cyanide. Uh, of course, there's the phone call. There's oh, the phone call. oh, good, Carol. The president's calling. Okay. Good. Yeah, or it's your boss saying, "Stop talking about drinking on air." That's right. <laughs> Fair enough. Okay, so as I... I mean, my boss. Yeah. yeah, really, that's right. What do you do with all my drinking games on Hubble? Okay, so, <laughs> so let's go. We'll go ahead and get started. So for the first time, astronomers have been able to measure directly the composition of a super-Earth exoplanet um, and of the star system known as 55 Cancun. Uh, yes, I don't have any green beer yet, unfortunately, for our drinking game, but... Yes, we're gonna Maybe have to think what our word is. Yeah, we're gonna have to come up with a drinking. Yeah, game. So you can drink coffee. I'll, or I'll come up with it. Don't worry. Yeah, I'm okay, always good. and I'm that, source it, of debauchery as always. Yeah. <laughs> so that means, and that voice is Scott Lewis, whom you guys know. He's our internet driver extraordinaire. And so, welcome back, Scott. It's good to see you again as well. Thank you. Tony. I don't know. This this hangout seems kind of exciting to me, guys. I can't wait to learn more about what this. Uh, what this exoplanet measurements are, are like and what they what they might mean. Um, but before we get going, and I introduce our guests from the University of College at London, we want to have you prepared to ask us questions. We want you to interact with us and join us in the St. Patrick's Day drinking game <laughs> where we have water. <laughs> 
and coffee. Okay. Oh, that's right. <laughs> All right. So, uh, we, but, but we do want your no. Seriously, we want your questions and comments during the hangout. Uh, and Scott, why don't you tell everybody how they can do that? Absolutely. So the, as I'm already seeing everyone loading Cree, and this is a star system that is about 40 light, year, 40 light years from Earth in the constellation of Cancer. And so joining me to talk about this are some a group from the University of College at London, all three of these guys. So we have Angelo Ciaris, he's a PhD student. We also have Ingo Waldman, a postdoc, as well as Marco Rochedo, a grad student. All of these guys are responsible in some way or another for the development of this technique, which we will get into. But welcome, guys. Is this your first Hubble Hangout? Hey. Hello. Thanks for having us. Yes. Hi, guys. All right, good. Well, thank you for joining us. So let's start with, uh, let's start with you, Angelo. Um, tell us a little bit about what you found and a little bit about this super-Earth. Give us some background on this. Uh, as you said, the super-Earth is uh, 40 light years away from uh, the Earth, and it's orbiting uh, its host star uh, in a, a very close, so the orbit is only 18 hours. Uh, this means that the, the temperature on this Earth... Whoa, 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 the orbit of this planet is 18 hours? 18 hours, yes. This is 